Side 2. Objective Bejo by John Peel. Continuing on page 41. He snapped off the contact and settled back in his seat. Hardly a promising officer, but you had to make do with whatever tools were at hand. He considered his next move. The intruder was about to become a Bajoran problem, which amused him. Let those weaklings try and figure it out. Of course, their first response was likely to be a request for aid from Captain Sisko on Deep Space Nine. They always went mewling to him for help at the slightest provocation. That would be interesting. The Federation was a lot more likely than the Bajorans to get answers about this vessel. And if the Caratan paid proper attention, then Ducat would get the information too. A ship 8,000 miles long. Normally, technology didn't greatly impress Ducat, unless it was in the field of weaponry, but this was no mean achievement. The secrets that the intruder revealed might prove to be quite helpful. Should he give Sisko a call and alert him to the incoming problem? It would be a friendly gesture, after all. And Ducat enjoyed being friendly with the human, from time to time. As humans went, Sisko was almost likable. On the other hand, there was no need to overdo friendship. Why not simply let the Bajorans send for Sisko and leave him in the dark? It might be more fun to watch him fumble his way about without help. Yes, that was it. Wait and see what happens, Ducat decided. He had a feeling that the intruder was up to something interesting in the Durain system. It would be educational to see just what that might be. Drawn surveyed the conference room and noted with satisfaction that every hive master was present, including Tork. The youngster looked a trifle pale, but otherwise unaffected by his recent experience. He might be an idealistic fool, but he was obviously also resilient. There was an air of excitement in the room, as everyone already knew what was happening. Drawn indicated that the recording was to begin, and then rapped on the edge of the table. Hive masters, he said in a strong, clear tone. The hour of fate is upon us. The next stage in the great design is about to commence. Macarn? The science master shuffled to his feet. Ah, the target planet has been selected, he announced. It is the fourth planet from the sun that we are now approaching. It is a world of some small industry which will be of assistance to us, and it contains much vegetation. Preliminary surveys indicate a fair amount of mineral and metallic wealth on the planet, though there has been extensive mining already performed there. We assume this was done by an off-planet species, since there is little evidence of much refined metal on the surface of the world. Drawn glanced at him sharply. There will be sufficient remaining for our needs, though. Ah, uh, yes, without doubt, Macon responded. There will be no delay in the great design. Excellent. Relieved, Drawn turned to Paquette. And how is our readiness? We have three wings of attack vessels standing ready, Paquette reported. The pilots have all achieved high scores in simulated runs, and I anticipate no problems. Our surveys show fewer than 100 vessels currently in flight in the system, and their weaponry is inferior to ours. Tork shuffled in his seat and leaned forward. You are preparing to attack the inhabitants? He asked, concern in his voice. We are preparing to defend ourselves, Pacat answered, snuffling loudly to show his displeasure. Had you attended the last meeting, you would know that the local race, calling themselves Cardassians, attacked our ships without provocation when last we met them. I am sure that none among us wishes to wait until they attack again before we prepare to defend ourselves. He stared pointedly at Tork, who sat back in his seat and closed his mouth. If that is quite clear, asked Dron. There were no further comments. He hadn't expected there would be. 
even Torque couldn't complain about defending themselves. Boran? The industry master stood up. My teams are all prepared, he reported proudly. We stand ready to harvest the coming fruits of our labor. Production is completely ready to commence as soon as the raw materials are obtained. Excellent, Dron complimented him. Then it is clear that we are ready, that the great design can go ahead. After half a million years, the plans of the first hive come to fruition, and we achieve our destiny. He gestured at the holographic representation of the planet that spun in the air above the table's surface. All departments will come to full strength, he commanded. Turning to his security master, he said, Braldar, the time has come to speak with these Cardassians in this system. Have a link established immediately. Of course, Raldar agreed. He set about tapping instructions into his comp. What only Drawn and he knew was that there would be several layers of recording taken when they established contact. Drawn couldn't take the chance that something might go amiss and spoil the records he intended to be kept for future hives. However, if the aliens said or did anything untoward, it could be redesigned in the records, Drawn decided. A moment later, the spinning globe above the table was replaced by a hologram of an alien race, the first that the other hive masters had ever seen. There was a murmur of shock and disgust from those assembled about the table. Even the liberal Torque and the elderly Hosier couldn't restrain themselves. Well, the alien was ugly. It was also quite obviously not a Cardassian, but there was no need to mention that. This might be some subject species, for example. The being was roughly the size of a member of the hive, and it stood upright, but that was about all the resemblance there was. It, possibly a he, was shellless, and its skin was a pallid pink instead of a rich gray. There was hair visible on the crown of its ugly head, and the being wore what appeared to be cloth draped over the larger part of its body. Drawn wasn't too surprised. A creature that grotesque would have to cover itself. The being spoke for a moment, and then the translation computers could begin to decode its vocalizations. First Minister Warren of Dorain Four, the creature was saying, please identify yourselves. Drawn took a breath and then said, I am Hive Master Drawn of the Hive. You will leave your world immediately. We will allow you two days to evacuate your population. What? Was this alien stupid as well as deformed? Drawn repeated his message patiently. Do you comprehend, he added. You're insane, Warren finally spluttered. No, Drawn answered. We are not insane. You have two days. If you require assistance in evacuating your people, we will be willing to assist. He moved to cut the communication. Wait! Warren exclaimed, holding up a hand. You... you're serious about this? Of course we are serious, Drawn replied. This is not a matter we would joke about. But you can't be! The alien looked almost panic-stricken. What you ask is... unthinkable! Unthinkable, he explained. And we are not asking... We will allow you two days, and then we shall commence harvesting this world. If your people are not removed by then, they will simply have to suffer the consequences. We have no desire to injure anyone, but we will not alter our schedule. No! Warren seemed to have a grip on whatever low intelligence he possessed. The message had obviously sunk at least part way into his brain. This is our world. And you cannot have it without a fight. Drawn had been afraid of this. The alien was clearly insane. You are not utilizing the world, he explained. We have need of it, and therefore we shall make use of it. Please stand aside and allow us to do this. Dorain 4 is our home, cried Warren. We won't let you have it. 
home. Dron shook his head in astonishment. You are clearly not an intelligent species if you believe that a ball of mud and rock is a home. It is simply a resource, neither more nor less. You are not using it, so we shall. He can't be serious, muttered Primon to the table at large. He thinks that this world is his home. What kind of deviants are these people? The kind we will have trouble with, predicted Pecat. They're obviously intelligent enough to build crude weapons, but too stupid to build a home of their own. Warren had been conferring with someone out of Dron's line of sight in feverish haste. He now turned back to face the hive master. You will cease your flight, he ordered. If you move any further into our system, we shall take it as a declaration of hostile intent and will be forced to defend ourselves going far better than Dron had imagined possible. It was quite obvious to all the others about the table that they were being threatened first. There would be no need to edit this recording at all. We are not an aggressive species, Dron replied carefully. We do not wish you any harm, but we need the planet that you call, he shuddered, home. If you try to interfere with the great design, we shall be forced to retaliate. Any injuries or deaths your people sustain will therefore be your own fault. You're not having our planet, Warren howled and cut the communications link. Dron allowed the picture to fade and waited a few heartbeats before he spoke again. It appears that we are dealing with a dangerously deranged species, he said sadly. For Cat, it would appear that your brave pilots will be forced to defend the hive. And they all stand ready, the Cat answered proudly. The alien aggressors will not harm the hive. That I vow. Good, Dron smiled. We all knew that we could count on you. He spread his hands in resignation. Well, we tried to do this without pain and bloodshed. Unfortunately, these aliens seem to completely lack logical faculties. We will be forced to fight them for what we need. Are there any further questions or comments? As he had expected, Torque stood up. Is this really necessary? he asked. Dron could see the pain on his face his nose wrinkling almost uncontrollably. Must we kill to obtain what we need? We all heard their spokesman, Dron told him. They threatened us. Any killing will begin with them and be on their own consciences. No, I mean, is there no other world we can use instead? Tork explained. One without such insane inhabitants. I am reluctant to condone the removal of a species that is obviously so feeble-minded. As are we all, Dron agreed hypocritically. Sometimes decisions simply needed to be made and then enforced. And there are indeed further worlds that offer what we need. Then why do we not use one of them? Asked Tork almost desperately. Makarn, prompted Dron. Ah, uh, because they lie beyond this one, the science master explained. And we shall indeed use them. Once the process of deconstructing Durain 4 is finished, then we shall need at least two further worlds. Ah, uh, and there is no telling whether their inhabitants will be any less maniacal than the ones here. We must face the possibility that we could be in an area of space whose inhabitants are all terminally deranged. Thank you. Dron signaled for Torque to reseat himself. None of us wish harm even to such a subintelligent species, but we have no choice. If they attack us, we will defend ourselves. Durain 4 will be the source of material for the next stage in the great design. Now, if there are no further comments, can I ask for a sign of assent? The cat and Raldar signified their approval instantly. One by one, the rest of the Hive Masters complied. As expected, Torque's vote was the last, but even he had agreed. 
So be it, Dron announced. The great design goes forward today. Gul Dukat watched the transmission from the Karatan with great interest. The messages between the intruder and Dorain 4 had been intercepted. The aliens were not backing down, and those idiotic Bajoran colonists on Dorain 4 were equally stubborn. The intruder's craft was advancing into the Dorain system, and the small fleet of ships the colonists possessed were massing to meet it. This should prove to be a most interesting day. Chapter 7 Warren turned to his aide in near panic, rubbing the bridge of his nose between thumb and forefinger, as he always did when worried. He snapped, Those maniacs are going to destroy our world. He forced himself to think for a moment. Get Major Morell and order an immediate launch of every fighting vessel we have. Tell him our very existence depends on his skills. Yes, sir, the aide said with alacrity, vanishing toward the communications room. Hurrying that way himself, Warren tried hard not to collapse in shock. It was unthinkable that anyone would be doing just what the alien intruders threatened, but they were quite clearly as serious as they were demented. Given the size of the incoming ship, he was virtually certain that they'd never hold this attack off alone. He needed help, and he needed it fast. Entering the communications room, he rushed to the nearest console. Clear whatever you're doing immediately, he snapped, and opened a channel to Bajor, highest priority. Yes, sir. The woman obeyed promptly, simply cutting the channel she'd been using and opening a new one. Whom shall I ask for? First Minister Shakar, and no one else, Warren answered feverishly. He tapped his fingers on the top of the console impatiently as the woman patched through the call. A moment later, Shakar's harried-looking face appeared on the screen. Yes, he asked, an edge in his voice. I'm very busy, so... Dorain 4 is under attack by an unknown alien species, blurted out Warren, unable to contain his panic any longer. They've threatened to destroy our world and kill us all. Shakar's face went almost blank, but Warren could see in his eyes that he was thinking fast. All right, Shakar snapped. Hold them as long as you can. What kind of defense do you have? Not much, Warren answered. Just a few dozen interceptors. We never dreamed that anything like this could ever happen. I'll mobilize whatever forces I can to help, Shakar promised. And I'll contact Captain Sisko for help from the Federation. Keep this channel open and send us all the information you can. He looked away from the screen. You, he called. Over here. Record everything that comes through at this board. He turned back to Warren. Do your best. Help is on its way. He moved out of sight, and a young woman took his place. Warren wrung his hands together. Help is on its way. But from Bajor, two systems away, it would be hours before anyone could arrive, assuming they were already in space. As for help from the Federation... How long would that take? By treaty with the Cardassians, they weren't allowed any permanent show of force in this sector. Any starships they'd send would have to take days to get here. It looked very, very bad for Dorain. All units, Morell transmitted. Signal in and identify yourselves. He stood on the bridge of the Morvan Falls, the largest ship in the Duranian fleet. Largest? It was a smallish battle cruiser with a crew of 58. It didn't have the firepower to take out a starship, let alone whatever their unknown enemy might fling at them. And judging from what his sensors were showing, the aliens must have a tremendous force. Their main vessel was thousands of miles long. How many attack ships might it hold? Still, it was all irrelevant. There was no question of his duty and his responsibility. He had to do his best to defend Dorain 4, and at the very least buy the planet all the time he could until reinforcements arrived. All ships reported in, his first officer announced. She grimaced slightly. 
86 ships, most of them low-level interceptors. We've got just three further cruisers, sir. And that will have to be sufficient, he replied firmly. Anything yet on the aliens? Not yet. She gestured at the screen, where the huge ship was already visible, even though it was still half the system away. They've not launched anything at all. She chewed her lip uncertainly. Do you think the whole craft is a fighter? We'd better pray it isn't, he answered. If it were, I can't think of anything this side of a Borg ship that might be able to stop them. He considered for a moment. All right. Signal all ships to begin closing in. Let's take the battle as close to the enemy as we can. She nodded. All ships, she called out. Prepare for action. Target ahead, bearing 190 Mark IV. Distance? Tuning her out, Morel studied the image on the screen ahead of him. What kind of weapons do they have? He wondered. And why are they so arrogant? So confident? The cat moved closer to Drawn. All of the Hive Masters were still in the conference room and would be until the battle was over, but they had broken into smaller clumps to talk quietly. Only Drawn sat alone, watching his comp to keep up to date with everything that was happening. They have launched attack vessels, the cat reported. They have begun the fight. Excellent. Drawn gave his friend a smile of satisfaction and confidence. Nothing your pilots cannot handle, I take it. Of course not. The cat sounded slightly shocked at the mere thought. At your word, I will launch the first flight. Drawn considered for a moment, then decided... Allow them to get closer, he said. I want it perfectly clear that they have commenced this action. They are scared, he added. They will fire the first shots. Then annihilate them. Understood. The cat moved off to his communications station. His eagerness for the impending battle showed in his jaunty steps. Drawn smiled again. The great design was almost upon them, and he had the honor and glory of leading the hive to their destiny. He glanced around the room, taking in the faces of the other hive masters. They all looked tense, but none of them looked worried, except for Torg. He was as nervous as a shallot tossed in water. And he was talking animatedly with that old fool, Hosier. Drawn frowned. What did the two of them have in common? And he shrugged the matter off. It wasn't really important. Neither of them had voiced any dissent to his policies. Neither of them would dare to object to the implementation of the great design. Target closing fast, the first officer reported. Morel nodded. Still no sign of their ships? He was juggling plans in his head. With his small fleet, there was no feasible way of attacking the main vessel. Not yet, she answered. And how about sensor readings on the intruder itself? They reveal nothing at all first officer reported. The sensors simply seem to slide off that metal. It is metal. I can't read anything at all inside the craft. City, whatever it is. There are several places in the skin of the ship that look like portals and... She broke off and bent over her screen. Sir, one of the portals has opened. The aliens have launched 100 ships. On screen, Morel ordered. The picture flickered and then showed a close-up of one section of the intruder. A portal had irised open, and dozens of small, dart-like ships were flooding out. Interestingly, they traveled in pairs. Arel's mind clicked on this. Was this an attack formation, or did they have some kind of need to be together? Signal all ships, he ordered. Engage the enemy at will. Yes, sir. She bent to the panel to issue the order. Morel studied the ships as they spiraled out from the alien craft. They were smaller even than most of his ships. They didn't look to be that formidable. 
Why then did he have a very bad feeling about this? Weapons, he called out. Primed and ready, the gunner answered. Shields at maximum. Take us in, he ordered the helmswoman. Sublight drive at half, full sensor sweeps. He turned back to his first officer. Any readings on those craft? She studied her board. Similar metallic construction to the intruder, she replied thoughtfully. Not as dense, but still almost impossible to break through. I read the power source from its reactor, but no sign of weapons build up. They do possess shields, she scowled. Pretty good ones, too. No weapons? Morel shook his head. That doesn't make sense, he complained. They're intercepting us. They must have some sort of weapons. I'm not reading any energy buildups, she insisted. Nothing to show that any weapons systems we know are being brought online. What was going on here? Morel nervously chewed at his thumbnail. What about projectile weapons? Maybe they weren't very sophisticated. Nothing that I can detect, she replied, sounding as puzzled as he did. There's nothing at all that I can pinpoint as a weapon on any of those ships. Suicide bombers, he mused. Maybe their plan was to collide with the Duranian craft and explode themselves and their targets. There's no sign of them trying to overload their reactors, the first officer objected. Surely they'd do that to take out another ship. Maybe, Morel agreed uncertainly. He'd never encountered anything like this. The alien ships, all in pairs, were now targeting his ships and moving to intercept. What kind of soldier went into battle without weapons? The answer was obvious. None. They had to have some kind of weapon. So, what was it? Careful, he muttered to himself as the first of his interceptors sped toward the spreading alien ships. They're up to something. And then the firing began. The two lead ships phasered blasts at the closest of the enemy ships. There was a brief flare of shields. Report, barked Morel. The alien ship's shields are standing, his first officer answered. They're very strong from the prow, she added. Built to take attack. He nodded his comprehension of the report and through narrowed eyes surveyed the images on the screen. The enemy still hadn't fired back, and there was no sign of any weapons. What was going on here? The first of the twinned alien ships approached one of his interceptors. Morel concentrated on seeing what they were going to do. Apparently, they did nothing. Each of the ships simply passed the interceptor by on opposing sides, leaving only minute wreckage as the interceptor seemed to just disintegrate in space. What the hell happened? Morel growled, frustrated, puzzled, and furious. What did they do? His first officer looked up, stunned. I don't know, she answered. They didn't use any kind of energy at all. The ship just fell apart. Ships don't just fall apart, he exclaimed. They must have done something, and I want to know what. His eyes were riveted to the screen when two more alien ships passed over and below a second interceptor. Like the first, it seemed to simply fall apart as it fell, dissolving into tiny, indetectable pieces. What was going on here? What kind of weaponry did these aliens possess? And was there any defense against it? Morel knew he didn't have very long to discover the answer to that. Phaser blasts seared across the screen again, but their energy was dissipated against unflagging shields. A third and fourth interceptor simply ceased to exist. They were losing this battle. He was losing his men, and the aliens were simply plowing through his ships as if they didn't exist. Once they had passed, the ships didn't exist. Tork stood nervously, clenching and unclenching his hands as he watched the holographic representation of the battle above the conference table. The aliens had begun the fight, true, but they were being annihilated by the hive forces. Why did he feel so bad inside? 
It is never very pleasant to watch anyone die, Hosea told him gently. I know. I'm very old, and I've seen most of my friends, colleagues, and family die. He gestured at the ongoing battle. Even if they are aliens and insane, it is still regrettable that they perish. Yes, Tork agreed. I wish it had not come to this. If they had only been reasonable. Hosea smiled. If Snarks had wings, maybe you could train your breakfast to come to you, he quoted. What is, is. That is another thing you learn with age. Regrets help no one, least of all the one who regrets. These aliens are what they are. We are what we are. He pointed again at the whirling images. Because of that, this was inevitable. Tork sighed. And how many more times will it be inevitable, he asked. That depends on the aliens in this new galaxy, youngster. Hosea sighed, too, a long, protracted sound. To be honest, I am afraid we may be compelled to repeat this every time. Still, let us try and speak of less violent matters. You are new to the Hive Master status, and I know very little about you. Tell me about yourself. Unable to tear his gaze away from the battle, Tork wrinkled his nose slightly. This is not the time to speak of peaceful things. On the contrary, the oldster answered. Now is the perfect time. When wars wage without, he quoted, there is only peace within. Actually, Tork couldn't help but reply. The original reads, when war is without, seek peace within. Does it indeed? There was a hint of a smile on Hosea's face. How could I have misquoted so badly? It is not your fault, sir, Tork said quickly, thankful he hadn't caused offense with his unthinking reply. It is just that, well, I am a scholar of the texts. I have been researching them for some time. And you found errors? asked Hosea, obviously being deliberately provocative. Not that, Tork said, aghast. Merely some small changes. Indeed. Hosea seemed to be genuinely interested in hearing what he had to say, unlike most of the elders. Tork had been afraid that his research might have brought him trouble. Instead, they had brought him the badge of a hive master. You no doubt recall the time of the 203rd hive, he said. Not personally, Hosea answered, laughing. I'm not quite that ancient, but I know all the stories of the mutineers and their overthrow, of course, and their attempts to change the texts and alter our great design. But nothing came of it. Not exactly, Tork answered. You see, I studied the commentaries from the early hives, 204 through 7 specifically. Osir's nose twitched. Not many now read those commentaries, he said slowly. They've been considered obsolete and generally pretty foolish for fifty millennia. I hope you have not been too influenced by them. Not the commentaries, Tork agreed with a bark of derision. I assure you they are just as foolish as legend has it. No, what interested me is the way the scholars quoted the texts... Their versions are very similar to ours, but in some cases they differ slightly, as in the quote you just used. Now, it seems to me that the ancient scholars were much, much closer to the texts than we are, and would therefore have known them better. To misquote them, and to do so quite consistently, is hard to believe. And you chose to believe instead, prompted Hosea. My conclusion was that... There have been some minor alterations to the texts over the millennia, Tork answered slowly. Nothing large, nothing significant, but changes nonetheless. 
an intriguing suggestion, Kosia said dryly, and not a popular one, I would wager. So, how is your research progressing? Not too well, admitted Tork. Being a hive master is virtually a full-time occupation, and with the great design now so close to fulfillment, he spread his hands helplessly. Kosia nodded and then directed his gaze across the table. Tork followed suit and saw that Drawn was watching them closely. As soon as he realized he had been seen, Drawn looked away. I wonder if that is why you were made a hive master, mused Hosea, so that you wouldn't have time for your research. Tork couldn't follow this. I am sorry, I do not understand. Hosea gave a throaty chuckle. In my youth, I was a bit of a rebel, too, he confessed. In a hive would be. Perhaps you have been kept deliberately too busy to continue your studies. It is worth considering, you know. After all, if the texts have been changed, only the hive masters could have done the work. And I doubt the current Grand Master would want that fact known. Startled by this, Tork exclaimed, You cannot be suggesting what it sounds as if you are. Can I not? Hosea shrugged. I am old. Perhaps I am too old. Perhaps my words get away from my brain. His nose wrinkled. Or perhaps you are too young to be dedicated completely to the truth. He patted the youngster on the shell. Think about what I have said, and then think about what you will do about it. Kira glanced up as her board registered an incoming message from Bajo. It had been pretty peaceful on the station for the past few days. If she ignored two fights in quarks, one smuggling arrest, and several minor breakdowns. It had seemed even quieter since O'Brien and his engineers had been spending most of their waking hours working on the Defiant, trying to get it spaceworthy once again. It was strange not to see him fiddling with the systems here in Ops. This was probably nothing but a routine call, but Kira felt a little tense as she punched the command to bring the call up on her screen. Her worries faded as she saw Shakar's face. Shakar! she exclaimed in delight. She had fought under his superb leadership as a freedom fighter while Bajor had been occupied by the Cardassians, and now sadly saw far too little of him. I haven't heard from you since you won the election. By the way, I haven't con... This isn't a social call, Nerisse, he said tightly, and Kira stopped talking. There was pain in every line on his handsome face. Can I speak to Captain Sisko, please? It's most urgent. Ten seconds, she promised, recognizing the urgency in his voice. She glanced up at Sisko, who was conferring with Dax in low tones at the science station. Captain, she called. First Minister Shakar is calling, extremely urgently for you. Sisko sighed. If it's not one thing, he muttered. He strode across the room to her panel. Kira moved aside to give him access, but remained close enough to hear what was said. First Minister, it's always a pleasure. Not this time, Shakar said bluntly. I've just received a distress call from Derain 4. They're under attack by some unknown alien species and need help desperately. I've already dispatched what ships I can spare, but... Understood, Sisko answered. Kira could see the tension grip him as he spoke. I'll do what I can. We'll contact you again when we're on our way. Sisko out. He cut the line and turned to Kira. Tell O'Brien that the Defiant is leaving now, he ordered. Assemble the crew. I'm going to punch through a request for aid from Starfleet. Kira knew she had to state the obvious. Captain, the Defiant is still not repaired. According to O'Brien's last report, there's still only partial shields, and the weapons aren't online. I'm aware of that, Major, Sisko said softly. But do you want us just to sit here and do nothing? She shook her head vehemently. Neither do I. Tell him we launch in 15 minutes, and he can do whatever work he's able to in transit. But battle ready or not, we launch. 
Chapter 8 The battle was faring far worse than Morel could ever have feared. So far, over twenty of his small fleet had been annihilated by the alien's peculiar weapon, and none of the enemy's ships had been even damaged. The intruders were well protected, and the few Duranian ships were not well armed. This had never been considered a dangerous system, and the need for defense had seemed slight. What he would give for a single dreadnought right now. This was not the time for wishful thinking. Norell called out to his first officer. Order Red Flight to attack the six alien ships on heading 109 Mark 4. I want two ships to go for the head-on assault and the other four to try from behind. Tell Red Leader to single out one of the intruders and attack it with all of their firepower. She nodded. An idea? A hope. In fact, it was more of a wish but Morel had little else to try. In all of the attacks, the intruders had always flown in pairs, a precise distance apart. Whatever their weapon, perhaps it required two ships for it to be effective. In which case... He watched the schematics as Red Flight whirled to meet the targeted enemy craft. Morel tensed as he saw two of his ships flying directly for the three pairs of alien vessels. The other four of his ships boosted, spun, and came whipping in from the rear of the aliens. All four opened fire on a single ship. Their shields are overheating, his first officer reported. If they can keep this up just a short while longer... There was a burst of white light from the screen. One alien down, she called, elated. Then grimly, two of red flight are also destroyed. They were bad statistics, but Morel felt a little happier knowing that the intruders could be taken out. And the destroyed ship's partner, he snapped. The first officer studied her screen. It's pulling away, she reported. Red leader is initiating pursuit. No, Morel ordered. Let it go. Tell him to target another ship instead. His hunch had been correct then. The enemy had to fight in pairs. We only need to destroy one of each duo to stop the attacks. Order all units to so target their attacks. We can beat them, he added, trying to sound a lot more confident than he felt. They had destroyed one enemy ship at a cost of almost two dozen of their own. At this rate, the battle wouldn't take long, and his forces would be utterly annihilated. A cat glanced up from the projection, grimly. One of our ships has been destroyed, he reported to Drong. Its partner is returning to the hive. How soon will the next flight be ready, Drong asked. Very shortly, the defense minister answered. Two time units at most. The natives cannot possibly destroy many more of our ships. Drong nodded his understanding and then turned to Boran. How soon before we can commence extractions? In slightly less than three units, he replied. The generators are almost at peak. The fields are beginning to be generated. As soon as we are in orbit of this world, we can start our work. Good. Dron studied the projection of the battle again. The fewer of our youngsters who die, the better. He clenched his fist as if clutching at the planet ahead of them. And the aliens will pay for this attack of theirs. Give us full power, Sisko ordered as he took the command chair on the Defiant. O'Brien sighed. I wish I could, Captain. He shrugged. Eighty percent's about the best you'll get. And there's still no weapons online. Fontana's working on them right now, but I can't promise anything. I know, Chief, Sisko said gently. Whatever's humanly possible... I know that you'll accomplish, but we must try to help. Aye, O'Brien agreed. We'll do all that we can. Helm ready, Dax reported. Course plotted and laid in. Sisko nodded and glanced around the bridge. It was a lot tidier than before, with most of the circuit boards replaced and all of the non-repaired material removed. Then let's go, he said simply. Warp as soon as we possibly can. Understood, Dax assented. 
She tapped in the codes, and the umbilicals attaching the Defiant to Deep Space Nine were retracted. Dax nudged the ship away with the thrusters, then switched to impulse. They streaked away from the station, which hung in view on the main screen. Sisko wondered with a pang whether any of them would make it back again. There was so much still to be done. And there was Jake waiting there. Would he see his son again? Shrugging off the depressing thoughts, Sisko tried to concentrate on the mission. Even without weapons, there had to be something that they could do to help out. Didn't there? Startled by the sudden chime that shattered her train of thought, Sana answered her comp. Harl's face floated out from the screen. Disappointed, she said, Harl. Yes, I know you were hoping it was Torque instead, her friend said, his nose twitching. Sorry, it was just me. You have not managed to reach him yet and tell him about your predicament. No, Sana answered. He is in a meeting with the other hive masters and cannot be disturbed. Well, I know why, Harl informed her. The great design is underway, Sana. We are ready to begin phase two. Sana stared at his image. How can you know that? He gave a barking laugh. I have just had my determination, he informed her. I am now a proud processor. Imagine that. And I have been told that we are in emergency working conditions. Preparations have begun. You know what this means, don't you? Icy dread clutched at her shell. Yes, she said softly. I knew that we were approaching our target star. We must now be preparing to mine it for everything we need. Exactly. And Torque and the other hive masters are in session because there are aliens on this world. They are refusing to allow us to take what we need. Sana let that thought sink in. Then we are at war, she asked, using the unfamiliar word. Yes. Harl's face twisted in anger. Those bastards have finally done it, Sana. They're planning to wipe out an alien civilization to take what we need. And Tork has obviously gone along with their plans. Now what do you think of his lofty morals? Sana felt the shock of Harl's accusation sinking into her stomach. She could not believe that Tork would ever agree to anything immoral, let alone the destruction of a race of alien creatures. Harl had to be wrong. He had to be. I do not know, she said finally. But I will discover the truth. She stood up, determined to act. I shall go to the Hive Master's chambers and demand to speak with Tork. They'll never allow it, Harl replied. They will have to kill me to stop me, Sana said simply. I must know the truth. Harl hesitated and then nodded. You are brave, Sana. Listen, there is one here I am assigned to work with who shares my views about the Hive Masters. We are evolving a plan to create a little trouble. Harl, she protested, afraid for her friend. He was so hot-tempered, and if he wasn't careful, he might do something very foolish. You are an adult now, she admonished him and can be punished for your actions instead of merely being reprimanded. I know that, he answered. I am not stupid. I will be careful. Take care in your turn. And... He grimaced again. I know how hard it is for you to think ill of Torque, but you must be prepared to see that he may have already changed. He is a hive master now. He is a hive master now. Sana agreed. But he has been Torque all of his life. He will not change. She lowered her head slightly. But I, too, am not stupid. I will hear what he has to say, and I shall make my own decisions. Harl nodded. Be strong, he said, and then cut his transmission. Her head whirling, Sana left her small apartment. It was not far to the chambers, and she could make it in two units or less. It would give her time to decide what she would say to Tork, 
if she was allowed to see him. Despite her words earlier, she was not sure that she would be allowed to see him. And then what would she do? What can you tell me about Durain Four? Sisko asked Major Kira quietly as he stood beside her. Is it likely to be defended? Hardly. Kira's face twisted as she brought back her memories. The place was originally a Cardassian slave camp. It's rich in deposits of many metals. The Cardassians shipped Bajorans there to work in the camps and then die. We finally liberated the planet, but we were unable to bring every prisoner back to Bajor. Kira paused and took a deep breath. There were over 400,000 prisoners, many in poor health. The provisional government sent what medical supplies we could manage to help out, along with some able-bodied volunteers. The former slaves became farmers and colonists. She grimaced. Until now, it was actually shaping up pretty well. Durain's soil is good for crops, and almost anything can grow there. Bajor has been importing food from them, and the colonists have done pretty well for themselves. She sighed. They've got a few ships, Captain, mostly old and many obsolete. They wouldn't stand up well to a spitting match, let alone a firefight. Sisko had been afraid of that. Shakar said he was sending what aid he could. And I'm sure he has, Kira agreed. The problem is that it isn't much. You know we don't have many ships, Captain. If this invader is serious, they could wipe out Durain without even working up a sweat. She slammed her fist down on her console. Damn it! And we don't even have our weapons capability. We're walking into a war zone without any protection. What can we do? I'm not sure, Major, Sisko admitted. But whatever we can do, we shall. We can only pray that it doesn't result in a shooting match. Trying not to allow the worry in his heart to show on his face, Sisko walked slowly back to his command chair and sat down. From all reports, the situation was not good, and it didn't look like it would get any better. If only it didn't get any worse. What are they doing now? Morel stared at his screen, puzzled. The battle, if you could use such a term for this one-sided fight, was trickling out. Most of his ships had been destroyed by the enemy. They had managed to take out six of the aliens, but that was all. In the past few minutes, six heavy interceptors had arrived from Bajor. Their firepower was much greater than that of any of Morel's ships, but they were just as vulnerable to the enemy weapon. Two of the new arrivals were already floating dust. And now this. The huge alien intruder had slowed considerably. It was approaching Durain 4 now, Within a few thousand miles, it looked like a huge predatory fish attacking a smaller ball-shaped prey. Morel didn't know what was going to happen, but it didn't take a genius to guess that whatever it was, it wouldn't be good. I'm picking up energy readings from the craft that are off the scale, the first officer called in alarm. They're powering up some incredible stuff in there, sir. Energies like none I've ever seen. Prophets, swore Morel. To the communications officer, he added, Get through to Warren and the council. Tell them that they'd better get everyone off the rain that they can. He stared in shock and horror at the enemy vessel. What was going on? The two spread wings started to move. It looked like an unhurried folding of the wings to envelop the planet. But Morel knew that the process only seemed slow because of the scale. Those wings had to be moving at incredible speeds. The intruder was starting to enfold the rain in its terrifying embrace. Power levels rising, the first officer said, choking. Whatever they're going to do is about to start. As Morel stared helplessly at the screen, the undersides of both wings started to glow with power. Crawling, flickering tubes of incandescent light slashed across the metallic surface. The power buildup was enormous. The lights glowed, writhed, and burnt their way across the wings. Then, like some student science experiment on static electricity, 
The bolts suddenly snapped across the intervening space from the enveloping wings and into the planet's atmosphere. Prophets! Morel breathed in horror. Flashing across the skies of Duraine, the blinding bolts of light finally connected with the surface of the planet. Wherever the beams touched, huge clouds of dust, smoke, and vapor rose. The clouds then started to rise toward the enveloping ship above the planet. There, boiling away the surface, Morel gasped. Those beams are destroying Duraine. Helpless, enthralled, appalled, command crew stared at the ghastly image on the screen. Beams of light, of destruction, lanced from the intruder, tearing into the surface of Duraine. Wherever the beams touched, boiling columns writhed upward and were suctioned off toward the predator somehow by the incalculable energies involved. The rain was being annihilated while they watched, unable to do a thing to save their world or their people. Chapter 9. At the mine site in Formax, the blasts of energy burned the ground, searing through hundreds of feet of soil to the rich mineral deposits below. Several hundred miners were incinerated in the deadly beams of light, a few grams of metal in their vaporized bodies being added to the metals being siphoned off into space. The ground cracked, shook, and collapsed under the barrage of energy. The old tunnels collapsed, and more people died in the devastation. The mine supervisor barely had the chance to scream before she too burned away. She had been standing three miles from the impact point, but the bare shadow she left on the desiccated soil vanished as the earth trembled and imploded in the wake of the attack. Similar scenes of devastation occurred all across the surface of Duraine 4 as the planet died. Warren was beyond panic now. His mind had almost overloaded on mental and emotional pain. His world was being murdered around him, and there was nothing he could do about it. The various monitor screens showed devastation after disaster all over the peaceful planet he had governed only this morning. The high-intensity energy beams were tearing the world apart as they sought out metals, minerals, and anything else the invaders wanted. Warren wasn't even bothering to try and cope with the death tolls, because thousands were added every minute. Some died in the barrage, others when the superheated atmosphere burned them down. Others died in the earthquakes caused by the beams. So few had been able to escape this incredible devastation. Whatever spaceworthy craft there had been on Duraine had been filled to capacity and sent off into space, the invaders would probably massacre the survivors as they fled, but perhaps some would stand a chance of escape. And hopefully, somehow, extract revenge for this genocide. We have to get out of here, one of his aides screamed, barely audible over the terrifying roaring outside. The air that had boiled away into space had created a vacuum. Hurricane-level winds whirled across the planet as nature tried to fill that void. The winds were ripping apart what few buildings and structures the earthquakes and energy rays hadn't managed to destroy. And go where? Warren yelled back. There's nowhere left to escape to, and no ships left to flee in. The aide was beyond thinking logically, however. He simply bolted for the closest door, running for his life. For a second, Warren considered following him. What was the point? Out there or in here, he would still die. It didn't matter any longer. There was the familiar hum of a transporter beam, and for a brief second, hope flared within the minister. Somehow, they were being rescued. Maybe it was the Federation at last, or... His heart fell as he realized that the targets of the transporters were not the survivors. In a shimmer of light, blocks of computers, equipment, and anything still intact were vanishing. The invaders weren't content to destroy the inhabitants of Duraine 4. They were even robbing the corpses as they died. No! Warren screamed, 
shaking a futile fist at the sky. It was pure white now, as energy bolts arched from horizon to horizon, dismantling everything in their path. The ground shook beneath his feet, sending him reeling against one of the now blank walls. In a shower of exploding glass and mortar, that collapsed. Warren's dead body was briefly buried under half a ton of brick and steel before the energy arcs played across it, vaporizing everything. Heart of the prophets, breathed Morel. His mind refused to function as he saw the destruction of his home world. This is genocide! Sections of the crust of Durain were breaking apart as he watched. The inner magma of the planet surged free, spurting up in great geysers of boiling rock. Nothing could survive that. He finally broke his gaze from the screen and stared into the shocked faces of his bridge crew. They were even more affected than he was, he realized. Every one of them had lost families, friends, and neighbors in the Holocaust. As Durain seethed, cracked, and bubbled, every one and everything they knew must surely have perished. Morel tried to concentrate. The intruder was still sucking the last dregs of whatever it wished. The energy fires were still blazing, but there was no atmosphere left to conduct the great discharges any longer. Incandescent blasts continued to rip through the heart of Durain. Enough he announced. It was impossible to help his world any longer, but perhaps it was not too late to extract some measure of vengeance. Turning to his first officer, he ordered, Set course for the closest of those portals you discovered on the intruder. Maximum speed. Turning to his engineering officer, he added, I want all warp drives to be overrun. Throw the damn dampers away, and I want the containment fields downpowered. None of them had to ask him what he meant. And thankfully, not one of them questioned his orders. As they moved to obey, he saw only the desire for revenge in their otherwise bleak eyes. Morel collapsed into his seat, drained of everything save the desire for revenge. Perhaps his phasers could do no damage to the alien craft. Well, they'd see what a starship with its warp core breached might do when it crashed into the intruder. Satisfaction filled Dron's being as he watched the projection of the target planet that hovered over the conference table. As anticipated, the energy beams were boiling away the much-needed metals and chemicals of the dying world. The comp was scrolling facts and figures faster than anyone could possibly read, as the tally was taken of the resources obtained. The transporter rooms were taking all the intact machinery they could find for future salvage, and the botanical receptors had rescued billions of units of plants and edibles. The processing of this world was going well. John glanced up as he realized one of the messengers was standing beside him. What is it? he asked, annoyed at being disturbed in this moment of triumph. Can you not see that I am busy? My apologies, Grand Master, the female answered, bowing her head obsequiously. There is a female at the chamber door who insists she must speak with Hive Master Tork with great urgency. Send the fool away, snapped Raldar, looking up from the projection. You know we are not to be disturbed whilst in session. Wait, Dron ordered, as the messenger started to turn. This female... Would her name be Sana? The messenger bowed again. Indeed. Dron smiled slightly. Then by all means you had better pass on her message to Hive Master Tork, he told her. And tell the Hive Master that he has excused his duties for the moment to speak with her. The messenger bowed again and hurried away. Dron smiled once again, this time at Raldar. She has no doubt come to tell Tork that she has been assigned to Team Two, he explained. Tork will then need to save her. Dron tapped his fingers thoughtfully on the edge of his shell. He will have to come to ask for a favor from me. I have been watching him as this recovery operation has been taking place. 
he did not look happy. I have a strong suspicion that he will attempt to block our next procurement. If he is in our debt, however, this will prevent him from an outcry. Raldar inclined his head. A wise plan, he murmured. I know, Dran agreed. He turned his attention back to the holographic projection. Now, to business. I see that the operation is 30% accomplished in so short a time. I think we shall have to publicly commend Boran and his team for their magnificent work. The rape of Durain continued. We're approaching Durain 4 now, Dax called from her console. We can drop out of warp in two minutes. Understood, Sisko answered. He had been monitoring all the information he could from Bajor. All transmissions from Durain had died out more than 20 minutes earlier. None of what had come through, though, was good. It sounded as though the invader was annihilating everything and everyone in its way. Sisko slapped his comm badge. Sisko to O'Brien. Chief, tell me something I want to hear. O'Brien's voice floated back. Sisko could hear the strain in it. Well, the good news is that shields are up to 80%, Captain. The bad news is that it'll be at least two more hours before Fontana and I can get the weapons systems back online. The circuit boards here were really riddled. All right, Chief, Sisko said, trying not to sound too disappointed or worried. I know you're doing your best. Can you return to the bridge? I know I'm going to need you here. Sisko out. He stared at the screen thoughtfully, weighing his options. With the shields almost back up to strength, at least they had some protection against whatever the aliens were using as weaponry. But without firepower, they weren't going to be able to sway the course of the battle much. Which left diplomacy, if that had a chance of working. If he couldn't make the aliens listen, then there would be little option but to run for cover, tail between his legs. And he hated that option. It would look as if he were abandoning his responsibilities, and the situation was appalling enough without that. Dax glanced around from the navigation console. Approaching the rain, she reported. Even she looked tense. Full impulse, Sisko ordered, focusing all his thoughts on what was about to happen. Dax's hands flew across the panel, and there was the subtle shift in engine thrumming that signaled change. Full impulse, she reported, switching main screen. All eyes on the bridge were drawn to the screen as it sprang to life. There was a collective gasp of horror at what they all witnessed. Durain was virtually invisible, with the intruder vessel draped about it. Bolts of celestial lightning ravaged the smoking blackened core of the murdered planet. About 30% of its mass was gone either to the ship or boiled off into space. Sisko managed to swallow and called out, Life signs. Julian, looking pale and shaken, managed to turn back to his station. His fingers shook as he fought to gather readings. On the planet, none, he answered, his voice haunted. I can't get any readings from the intruder. I'm picking up several hundred ships, Kira called from her post. With weaponry offline, she was staffing the science station with Julian. Most of them are fleeing the planet. Hard to say how many survivors made it, but there can't be a whole lot. There's still some fighting going on, Odo added. I'm reading eight alien vessels, unfamiliar configuration, and three Bajoran craft. On screen, Sisko ordered. Almost anything had to be better than watching the destruction of Durain. The picture shimmered and was replaced by one of four of the alien's dart-like craft speeding toward two of the defenders. As Sisko watched, he heard the turbolift door hiss open. Bloody hell! That was O'Brien's voice. The first two alien ships caught up with one of the Duranian ships. The lone vessel was pouring everything it could into phaser power but the shields of the attackers held firm. As the bridge crew watched, the two aliens passed on either side of the Duranian ship, 
which seemed to simply disintegrate into dust as they passed. Chief, what are they using? Sisko demanded. O'Brien was already at the closest sensor port, striving to get readings. Give me a minute, Captain, he said. Two new weapons in two weeks. Sisko dragged his eyes away from the screen. Dax, he said grimly. Try and raise the invader's ship. I have to try and talk to them. Got it, O'Brien said, with a trace of satisfaction in his voice. I've been trying to figure out what they were doing since we got the first pictures of the battle from Bajor, he explained. I had an idea, but my readings just confirmed it. So, what is it? growled Sisko impatiently. Monofilament. What? O'Brien spread his hands, fingers extended. Monofilament, he repeated. Wire only a few microns thick, virtually invisible and undetectable, but aligned molecules. The result is an incredibly tiny thread that can cut through anything at all with virtually no resistance. These aliens have made a sort of web out of it, stretched between two of their ships. They just fly past their target, and the monofilament slices it apart. Kira scowled. But why won't shields stop it? Because it's too thin, O'Brien explained. It's probably out of the shield's sensor range. It's only a couple of atoms thick, and no shields I know of can stop a couple of atoms from getting through. Can ours? asked Odo. O'Brien snorted. Not even at full strength, and we've only got 82% right now. That's not very reassuring, Odo answered. It's the best I can do, O'Brien informed him. But I have reconfigured the sensors to detect the nets. Kira looked thoughtful. Now we know why the enemy attack only in pairs. They need two anchors for the monofilament to keep it tense. Right, O'Brien agreed. It's fantastic technology. There have been experiments with the stuff before, but nobody's been able to stabilize monofilaments that thin. They generally just break apart. He shook his head admiringly. I'd love to take a peek at how they do it. They're marvelous engineers. And bloody killers, Kira growled. Look what they've done to Derain. Oh, they're killers, all right, O'Brien agreed. I was admiring their technology, not their actions. It's a damned shame to pervert science like that. Dax glanced up from her panel. I've managed to patch through to that ship, she announced. The person in charge is a hive master drawn, and he's reluctantly agreed to speak with you, Captain. Has he? asked Sisko softly. He felt a burning rage in the pit of his stomach at what these intruders had done. Then put him on the main screen. I think we all want to see him. The picture of Durain being ripped to ruins faded to be replaced by that of Hive Master Drawn. Sisko's right eyebrow rose slightly as he studied the alien. It was impossible to judge his size just from the picture, but he looked vaguely humanoid. Actually, Sisko realized what he most resembled was an armadillo. The most obvious thing about Drawn and the other aliens he could glimpse behind the Hive Master was that they all had segmented shells covering their backs and skulls. They were all varying shades of gray and brown, and none wore clothing of any kind. Their arms were long, with four thin fingers. Their necks were thick, their heads long. They had snouts with two slit nostrils in the front, and large expressive eyes. Small tufts of spiky hair protruded in clumps all across their non-shelled skin. What is it? asked the hive master, clearly annoyed. I am Captain Benjamin Sisko of the USS Defiant, Sisko replied, trying to keep his anger under control. The alien peered at him and then wrinkled his nose. Another alien species, he complained. How many of you are there in this system? That wasn't quite the response Sisko had expected or hoped for, but he wasn't about to get sidetracked. Hive Master, he said firmly. Call off your ships. They are not attacking, John snapped. They are defending. The criminally insane inhabitants of this world attacked us. 
That's not what I heard, Sisko replied coldly. Nor is it what I see. You have destroyed the rain and killed almost half a million people. Dron's snout almost rippled with muscular spasms. That is not what occurred. You have been misinformed. It was more than Sisko could bear. Your ship is sucking the shreds out of Doraine's dead husk, he cried. You're trying to tell me that you didn't do it? That is not what I claim, Dron replied. We have absorbed the planet, yes. It is necessary for our survival. But the fighting was begun by the inhabitants of this world. Captain Sisko, we offered them safe passage away and even aid in leaving. They refused our offer and attacked us. He spread his arms wide in a very human gesture. We had no choice but to retaliate. Sisko wasn't going to argue semantics while there were still people dying. Call off your ships, he repeated. Allow us to aid the survivors. Dron's snout twitched again. I would be more than happy to comply, he agreed. But only if you will guarantee that the attack on our hive will cease. If you do so, we would be glad to help you collect survivors. I don't think we'll need your aid, Sisko answered, only just managing to contain his fury. But I will make certain that you are not attacked. Drawn inclined his head. Then I shall have my defenders withdraw, Captain. He turned to give an order to one of his fellows. It is done, he reported. You may collect your peoples. Sisko nodded and made a chopping motion with his hand. Dax cut the link and the picture of Drawn vanished, to be replaced again by the smoking wreckage of Doraine. Start scanning for survivors, Sisko ordered the command crew. See how many need assistance. He stared at Bashir. Doctor, I suspect a great number of them will need considerable medical help. My teams will do what they can here, Bashir replied. And I'll organize DS-9 to prepare for refugees. Can you believe that creep? Kira snarled as she started the scans Sisko had ordered. Claiming that Durain started this? I believe that Dron really thinks that, Odo answered her. Or at least wishes us to believe that he really thinks that. Kira glowered at Sisko. Are we just going to allow them to get away with what they've done? She demanded. No, Sisko replied softly. I promise you, they will be held accountable for every death they've caused. But this is not the time to start a fight. We still don't have weapons capabilities. And even if we did, I doubt we could fight a vessel like that. So we just do nothing? Kira cried. No. Sisko gave her a very firm stare. We help the survivors. Then we think about retaliation. Do you understand me, Major? took a great deal of willpower, but Kira finally managed a very tense, curt nod. Yes, Captain. Good. Sisko deliberately turned away from her. He hated having to confront Major Kira, especially when a large part of his own mind was crying out in the same pain as hers. But the living came first. The dead could wait. Captain, Odo looked up from his panel, I'm reading signs of a dangerous engine overload from the Morven Falls. Its engines are going critical. Bashir paled. They must have had a malfunction. No malfunction, Odo contradicted him. The crew has done this deliberately. They are moving in toward the intruder on a collision course. A suicide run, Sisko exclaimed. They're on a suicide run. He stared at the image of the hive on the screen. What would happen if they succeeded? Chapter 10 Tork hurried out of the meeting room, relieved to be leaving the scenes of death and destruction he had witnessed. His conscience ached terribly with the strain of what he had seen. Had it been necessary? He still couldn't answer that, but he strove to bury his doubts as he went to meet with Sana. Today had been her determination, that much he knew. 
But why had she come to take him from such an important meeting? And why had Dron allowed it? Then Torg saw Sana, standing nervously, her fingers running up and down the edge of her shell. It was obvious to him that she was in serious emotional pain. There was a tick below her left eye. What is it? he asked, concerned and protective. What is wrong? I just spoke with Harl, she answered, the tick more pronounced. He told me that we have attacked an alien world and killed its inhabitants. Is this true? Torx's snout twitched in concern and anguish. Yes, he conceded. It is indeed true. She looked at him in anger, shock, and betrayal. How could you allow this? she cried. You, of whom I thought so highly. How? It didn't help Torx's emotional state that he had been pondering much the same question. They attacked us first, he explained. Their ships began the fight. We only retaliated after that. And their planet? Sana gestured behind her wildly. I am no fool, Torx. Processing has begun. Servos have started their operations. Phase two is beginning. That can only mean that the Hive has processed the alien planet. Yes, he agreed again, reluctant to meet her accusing stare. Their world is processed. We have almost everything from it that we needed. And its inhabitants? The fury of the question was like a knife between his plates... Most are dead. The survivors are being allowed to leave unmolested. How generous, Sana cried. What happened? Did even Hive Master Drawn's bloodlust get sated? They were all insane, Tork answered, trying to quell his own doubts also. They were dangerous. They refused to leave their world peacefully. Sana, they lived on the dirt of a planet and would not go. We could not reason with them. Is that any reason to slaughter them? She asked with a cold fury. No, he admitted. No, it is not. But I could think of nothing to do that would save them or stop drawn. I did not know that this would happen, nor did many of the other hive masters. Drawn told only those he could trust, I am certain. The rest of us were caught with our shells open, unprepared. I am sorry, Sana. I need time to think this through. I want to do what is right, but I am becoming more and more uncertain what that is. The anger in Sana's eyes faded slightly. I knew that you would never support such evil deeds, she told him, stroking the edge of his shell. And I am sorry if I was too harsh on you. No, Tork replied. You are not as harsh on me as I am with myself. This is a terrible situation, and I must find some way to honorably resolve it. I promise you that I shall do something, although at this moment I do not know what it is. You are a good person, Tork, Sana said, the affection in her voice unmistakable. And I only wish that I could support you in all the ways that you need. You always have, he said gratefully. And I am certain that you always will. This reminded him of his earlier thoughts. Today was your determination, he exclaimed. I had almost forgotten. Today you have become an adult. Yes, Sana agreed. And there was no mistaking even further pain in her voice. And it is the most wretched day of my life. Fear stabbed at his stomach. What do you mean? My determination was that I should become an astronomer. Which you desired. Indeed. But I am to be on team two. Torque was devastated by this news. There had always been this possibility, of course, but he had always refused to face it. He and Sana were meant for one another. The determination would have to reflect that and place them both together. 
And now, this, on top of everything else. Torque didn't have to say a word. Sana knew what was going through his mind, because it had to be going through her own as well. She gripped his hands. I know that it is terrible, she said, as gently as possible. But it is the determination. It has been decided. Yes. Torque spoke dully. He felt as if the shell had been ripped from him, leaving him naked and utterly defenseless. Harl believes that you will try to get the determination changed, she added. But I know that you are too honorable to abuse your powers in such a way. Then I wish I were not so honorable, Torque cried. To avoid losing you, I would almost go so far as to request a reassignment. Sana stroked his shell gently. But only almost. Yes. Torque sighed. It would be wrong of me to question the determination. It would seem that we are destined to be apart. Always. He shook his head in bewilderment. If there were only something I could do. You can be brave, Sana informed him. I am as shattered by this as you, my love. But we must both be strong. We have to face our destinies and do the best we can for the hive. If it must be a part, then no matter how difficult it is, we must bear it. Torque sighed again. I have much to bear, he told her. And saddened as I am by this news, there are more urgent calls on my attention. There must be something that I can do to mitigate the next phase of the great design. Sana managed a wan smile. If anyone can, it will be you. I have great faith in you. And great love for you. Remember that. Always. She turned and left the chamber swiftly. As if I could ever forget it, he murmured to himself. With a heavy shell, he turned and walked back to face his own destiny. Never before had he felt so alone or so bleak. Waiting for him inside the conference room was Hosier. Tork didn't want to talk with anyone, not even Hosier, at this moment, but he could hardly avoid it without being extremely rude. Bad news, guessed the elder. He wrinkled his snout in sympathy. Has your woman jilted you? Not exactly, Torque answered. She has been assigned to Team Two. Ah. Hosea nodded and then scratched at himself below one of his plates. And you, of course, are Team One. Well... What are you going to do about it? What can I do about it? Demanded Tork angrily. The determination has been made. And it is a basic of our life that the determination is never wrong. Hosea snuffled. Yes, I suppose it is. Still, even if the determination is infallible, it is an omniscient. Think about that. He gave Tork a friendly pat on the shell and then wandered off. What did he mean by that? Tork had no idea whether Hosea was making a point or whether he was simply getting senile. Still, as depressing as the news about Sana was, the most important thing to do right now was to try and figure out a way of alleviating the terrible pain that the next phase of the great design would cause to the inhabitants of this area of space if there was any way. End of side two.